The proposition is what's called a session type. And the session type gives you a prescription how this process has to, has to interact okay, um, along this channel. It gives you a prescription, a protocol for interacting along this channel, and also protocols, of course, for each of these to interact along these channels. Okay. So now we're going to go, in the rest of the lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the various constructs and see what's their concurrent meaning, kind of extracting a programming language okay, from doing that. All right, so um, let's start with cut, because this is somehow, cut is part of the key of this. So it's very, very important to understand the notion of a cut. So we write the cut rule again. So we have delta, okay, and we have A, and we have delta prime together with A, and we have C, and then in the conclusion, we have delta together with delta prime, and um, okay, we have C. All right. So let's say that we have some process P here, and process P offers along C this service A. So it provides a service A, and this process here actually uses service A. Okay, and I'm going to use the same channel name so that both processes communicate with each other along this channel, okay? And there's gonna be some process Q here. And Q is going to, okay, let me rewrite this into D. It's offer some service, okay? So this is not going to change. Um, and here what we have is, so something like this. We write it out explicitly like that, spawn P, and the continuous Q. Okay. So the operational reading of this is this process here, okay, spawns a process P, which provides service A along C, and then continues as Q using this new channel that's actually provided by P. So in the pi calculus, if you know about the pi calculus, you write this as there's a new channel X, oops, new channel C, which is private, and you run P and Q in parallel, okay? So this is a little more semantic, this is more syntactic in the way you think about the meaning of this connective, okay? So cut corresponds to spawning a new process, okay? Does that make sense? Probably not, okay? So if you can formulate a question, Otherwise, I'll plow ahead, and maybe over time it'll make more sense. Yeah? Could you uh, state in English again what the notation you got with the C? Okay. So the process P, so this is a process here. It provides a service along one channel. Think about the process of being the vending machine, right? The vending machine provides a service. The type here, okay, so the channel is one way to interact with the process, okay? And the type prescribes how the interaction is supposed to take place. Okay, so if you think of the vending machine as a process, the vending machine, vending machine process, would say along some channel C, we provide the ability to give me a dollar, give me another dollar, and then I'll react in some way. Okay, so I provide a service, but the vending machine doesn't have to, you know, operate in a vacuum. It can use some other services because it can have multiple processes plugged together interacting with each other, okay? So it will use other services, but it provide service along C. So in a functional setting, we don't have that because we have a term here, and all we do with the term, we evaluate it down to a value, then we're done. But if you have a process, it has to continue to interact with its environment. And so we name the channel along which it interacts with its environment. Okay? All right. So cut corresponds to process spawning or process composition. So this is kind of the semantics of the syntax. Okay. Um, okay. Identity is trickier, um, so um, 
Okay, maybe I'll discuss identity later. Okay, maybe I'll just discuss some meaning, some of the connectives. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Um, let's do uh, linear implication, right? Because it comes up in the vending machine, right? Okay. So the question is, if you have a context delta, okay, and we provide service A in, implies B along that channel, okay, we have delta, and let's call this D colon A, and then we provide C, a B, okay? So again, think about the vending machine, any idea what this might mean? from the process perspective? Okay, could you say it again? I think it's... Excellent, okay, so you input a process that produces A, and then you continue by providing B along the same channel. Okay, the only difference to what you said is we don't actually pass processes around. What we pass around is channels. So handles to interact with processes, but not the process itself. The process itself is running somewhere, interacting with this environment. Okay, so with this is some kind of an input. So we say that we receive D along channel C and continue with Q. And Q is going to do this. Okay, so it corresponds to an input along a channel, which is true, right? From the vending machine perspective, if you, you know, you have to input a dollar, a dollar is really just a handle on a process by which you can exchange a dollar in future time against something else, right? Okay, does that make sense? It's not too surprising, actually, because as a function, it means function application, so you give the function the argument and it computes the result. Here, you send the argument to the function, and it continues to offer along the same channel some more interactions. Okay, maybe another input and maybe an output. Okay, make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. If you only do input, then it's sort of like you pipe, you input, 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 input. Okay. But we'll see, because we can alternate input and output, it's more complicated, right? Because information can flow in both directions, as we'll see. Okay. Yeah? Is there anything special about that semicolon you're using? Well, this is supposed to suggest that this, then that. Okay, so if you're using a semicolon in imperative language, I'm using a, this kind of a suggestive notation. But it just says, do this, receive a C, and then continue as, as Q. Yes. If you're used to function programming, it's a monadic bind operation. But I wanted to hide that fact from you. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> you can never have too much information. All right. Okay, so wait. We only did one half of implication, right? So, so this is the right rule, which is an input. Now, what is the left the left rule have to be. So think of, let's think about that. So in the left rule, we have a context, delta, delta prime, and it has in it C, A, or B. Um, okay, I'll need a lot of room for that, probably. And it itself is going to be, okay, something like that. It offers some service to the outside. Okay, so let's try to fill in the pieces. Actually, before we fill that in, could everybody guess, if this is a receive, what would the left rule have to be? It would have to be a send, right? Because computation happens when the right rule meets the left rule. So if the right, right rule wants to receive, right, the left rule has to send so that they can communicate properly. When they're hooked up to the cut rule, right? At one end, there's gonna be process P, which provides a service. At the other end of the channel, there's gonna be a process Q, which uses it. And so they have to have exactly complementary action for computation to be able to proceed. So it's gonna to have to be a send, so we know that much. But let's figure out more about that. Delta prime, we prove A, 
and delta double prime. Uh, okay, we prove E. This is still along this channel, okay? So we want to send, and along which channel here? Obviously long channel C, right? So this process here does not, in this step, it interacts not along the channel that it provides, but it interacts with the channel that it uses. So this channel and all the other channels in delta prime and delta double prime, they're gonna be uh, dormant. You're not gonna do anything with that at the moment. We just send along C, um, along C, okay. The question is, what do we send along C? Okay, so we can send A because A is a type. Okay, so the next thing would be, ah, okay, we have something here. We have a P, and P offers service A. So the next thing might be, I might want to send, oops, this shouldn't be C. This should be D. Okay, next thing might say, we want to send P, but it's not P. Why is it not P? We never send processes. What do we send instead? Channel, so which channel should we send? D, okay, um, and after we do that, we continue as Q, and Q is the channel here, okay? That's not quite right. What's the problem here? Um... Right, so that's one problem. Right? So what happens is when we send D along this channel, then C from then on is gonna offer B, right? Okay, good. So, okay, so now we get to use the same channel. It changes state because we pass it a channel of type A, now it's gonna have type B. Great, we can use that. That's good, so that takes care of one problem. There's still a problem. Okay, what happened to B, P, the process P, here? Okay. Okay, so we can't do that. We can't just send D. We actually have to spawn P to offer, to provide the service. So the way we write this is like that, okay? So we spawn the process P, which will provide service uh, A along D. We pass that channel to C. Okay, and then we continue, and now we can use C at type B. Okay, so in the pi calculus, what would this be? Um, so we create a new channel D, and we send along C, the channel D, and then we execute P and Q in parallel. I think it may be, may be this, okay? So we create a fresh channel, okay, D, which Nobody else knows about except P, and P provides that for us. We send that along C, and then P and Q continue in parallel afterwards, okay? Operationally, if this is a piece of syntax, what we do is we spawn a new process P that offers a new channel, which we then send along C, and then we continue as Q, okay? And now these two fit together, and they execute in the correct way. So in fact, the computation step that happens when these two processes interact, one that's received and one that sends, is exactly the cut reduction which I showed you before. The cut reduction reducing a cut at a compound time to two cuts at smaller types, okay? Um, I can't show you that now because I won't get through all the connectives that way, but you have to trust me on that. So the engine of computation here, okay, in this setting is um, communication, and communication is modeled as cut reduction. And it's very different from substitution because substitution happens in one big step. You substitute n for x and m, like it's one big step. You go through all of m and you substitute n everywhere. Communication is a cut reduction is a tiny step because you reduce only a cut at a tensor b into two cuts very locally. So computation is much more local, which is why the sequence calculus is a good match for describing concurrent computation, much better match than um, natural deduction. Okay, yep. Okay, 
So the question is then essentially how are these little processes embedded in a programming language, right? And there's no unique answer to that. You can do this in many different ways. Um, in some sense, the, which I currently think is the best way, is that you introduce, you, you encapsulate this in a functional language in a monadic form. And then this is indeed a monadic bind, okay? Um, and then you have all of the functional language around you. And inside the monad, you have concurrent computation that sends and receives. And once we have gone through all the constructs, you'll see the remaining constructs of the language, okay? So, but basically, it turns out every cut reduction corresponds to a send or receive of something, okay? So every cut reduction is actually a communication. So one of the slogans, a cut reduction in linear logic corresponds to communication when the processes execute, okay? Okay. Uh, all right, let's do identity while it's up there, okay? So what does the identity do? Okay, so we're offering C along A, and we have D along A, and we have the identity of type A. Okay, so think about it this way. We have to write here process, which claims to provide A, and it can use D of type A, okay? So what we do is essentially we forward the, any client request to D. So we say we implement C by D, okay, something like that. And we terminate because we have done our work, okay? We have hooked up the client here on the other side, right? On the other side of the cut rule, there's a client um, with D, okay? So they don't know that they're no longer talking to us. They're not talking to some other provider that we're using. So this is, we usually call this forwarding. So we forward, it, forward the request, okay, and we terminate. So in cut, we spawn a new process, and with the identity, we terminate the process. So they're kind of inverses of each other, which is a well-known sort of, sort of theme in proof theory that cut and identity are inverses, okay? So we have done our work, okay? Um, so in a picture, if you want a picture of that, okay, I usually draw processes P like this. It uses many channels and it provides one channel over here. So that's what P looks like. Um, actually, I should write it the other way around. So it's consistent with my notation. So I provide here along C, and I use here along channels C1 through Cn, and this is a process P, okay? So for forwarding, the process says, use D to implement C, I only have one process here, which is only one channel here, which is D. And I have, I offer C over here. And this evolves essentially, it becomes by local reduction, by some kind of reduction, this picture, okay, where this provider over here, I don't know who it is, and I identify C and D over here. And I terminate essentially by just plugging these two wires together, okay. So that's a concept that doesn't exist in the pi calculus, and it's missing from the pi calculus, okay? Um, and once you do it from a logical perspective, you realize, oh, it should have been there, okay? Because it's a very important operation. Once you start writing programs, it becomes even more obvious. Okay, but let's fill in. We have um, hopefully enough time to fill out our entire board here with all the different connectives, okay? Yep. Sorry, could you just repeat the last part I said about Which last part? Oh, pi calculus does not have a forwarding construct. Okay, so you, because it's untyped, you can kind of program something that behaves similarly, sort of in the more primitives, but it's not given to as, you, as a primitive operations. And if you look at other languages like concurrent ML or joint calculus, the forwarding is missing and it makes it difficult to program in. Once you have this language to program in, you realize that it's a very important thing to be able to do. Now I can't show you any interesting programs, Today I can really only show you sort of the, the pieces of the language and you can read up with examples. Okay. Okay, everybody on board. So let's try to figure out what the other constructs mean to get a more complete language. So um, what's important to keep here? Everything. Okay, all right. Uh, okay. So
OK, let's do uh, external choice. So before I even start, you should maybe be able to tell me what external choice is. Should external choice correspond to an input or an output, a, a receive or a send? <coughs> external choice corresponds to a send. Well, it has to be a receive, right? Because you're offering the external world a choice, so you have to receive because it has to make a choice. So it has to tell you which of the two which of the two um, possibility, okay? So this is the provider, and the client has a chance to select between the two. So it has to be a receive because you have to see which one the client selected. Make sense? Okay. So here's how it looks. Um, so in Delta, we offer A with B along the channel C. Okay, and we have here um, A, and this is still along C, and here we have, and this is still along C, and this is some process P, and this is some process Q, okay? Okay, so now, we have to receive along this channel C something. Okay, I need some more space. What should we receive along channel C? Any nominations? How much information do we need? One bit, right? Just